we've been studying the book of James. It is the, um, <clears throat> it is the um, uh, Proverbs of the New Testament. Being that, it's the Proverbs of the New Testament. It has some very, very practical uh, issues. As we've said before, and, and I like to repeat it, uh, the theme of the book is the necessity of absolute, complete uh, faith and loyalty to the Lord. And the, the problem that James seems to be uh, addressing is that, that separation of faith and daily living. That separation of when we are uh, Sunday go to meeting people and we don't allow uh, God and his word to impact the rest of our life at all. Now, that's two extremes, of course. But at the same time, we do allow, and James, rec James recognizes this, that we do allow for the world to creep in on our daily living when we are not reading God's word on a regular basis. And speaking of reading, um, I like to uh, write down in my Bibles, uh, when I read a book, uh, I like to time myself, see how long it takes me to read this particular book. The book of James takes me approximately 11 minutes to read. Now, how many of you, as we are going through this study, do not have 10, 15 minutes to read? I'm a I am an average reader. Uh, I don't read exceptionally fast or nor slow. Uh, 11 minutes for five chapters is, 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 is good. We can, we can do that in the blink of an eye. We can, we can spend the time that we need to study God's Word. And as I've told my classes in the past, um, you will quickly forget whatever it is that I say about the book of James. But the book of James will always be there. And if you have it stored up in your heart and in your mind, then you will know what it says, and that's the most important thing. I hope to give some insights. I hope to motivate you and, and hopefully to, to uh, direct us in a way that God, through his word, is directing us. But it's God's word, again, that is going to direct us. And I pray to that end that you will continue to study and read, memorize uh, large sections of this book. It is just a marvelous book. I, I don't believe that I have studied, uh, that I have taught any other book in the Bible more than I have studied the book of James. And the reason is because it is so practical. It fits into our life. It's, it's just a, a, a marvelous book. As we talked about a few weeks ago, he, uh, James starts off by talking about being a servant, a, in the Greek, doulos, being that individual uh, that he describes himself as and motivating us. He's going to say in verse 2, consider it all joy. And the word consider has that, that concept, that idea of, that, that, that we are to, as we are walking, as we are leading, the world is watching us, consider how you're going to walk. You're going to go through trials. We're going to talk about that here in this section today. You're going to go through trials. You're going to go through difficult circumstances, and the world is watching. They're watching. In the book of Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas had been beaten, they had been uh, thrown in, in in the dungeon. They had been put in stocks. At about midnight, it tells us that they were uh, 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 praying and singing psalms of praise to God. Now, later on, when the earthquake comes and and the, uh, uh, the, the prison is shook into the foundation... Doors are open, chains fall off of all of the prisoners, and the, and the uh, jailer, the Philippian jailer, was just about ready to do himself in. He was about ready to stab himself, fall on his sword, and die, because if one prisoner escapes, that's his death sentence. And instead, Paul says, do yourself no harm. We are all here. 
I believe that has to come to verse 25 when it says that as they were singing and praying, it says then the prisoners were listening. The impact that Paul and Silas going through all of the difficult times that they'd gone through, going through the beatings, going through the stonings, going through all of those, being thrown in the prison, in the, in, in, in the dungeon, and chained up, and still praying and singing psalms of praise to God, had an, an immense and, 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 and incredible impact on all of those prisoners so that when the doors were open, the chains fell off, there's not a record of one of them escaping. Paul said, we are all here. Do yourself no harm. That's what James wants us to think about as we're reading this book, as we're applying it to our life. He is wanting us to understand that as we do this, there are people, your neighbors, um, uh, your co-workers, your, your, your fellow students at school, they are all watching to see how you go through the circumstances of this coronavirus, this COVID-19. How, how is it impacting you? Are, 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 are you living a life that exemplifies Christ and Him crucified? Are you living a life that, 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 that uh, cowers in fear over whatever this world has to throw at us? Our God tells us, that we need to be a people. We need to be a people who totally trust in him. And if we're going to lead people to Christ, it's going to be because, first of all, they're going to watch us. I have said this um, many times, that um, there are, in my computer, I have uh, approximately 43, 44 different English versions of the Bible. And people often ask me over the past 40 plus years that I've been preaching, what is the best translation? Well, the best translation is not the New American Standard, which is what I use. Um, uh, it's not the King James. It's not the NIV. It's not the New ESV. The best version of the Bible is God's Word in you and living through you so that the rest of the world can see. And that's where James wants us. He wants us getting to the point to where God's word has an impact on us. He's going to say later on, when, and I can't wait to get to this, probably next week, about the, uh, the, the man who, who comes to God's word and he's looking at what I like to call the mirror of the soul. That's God's word. That's his word. As I, as I look at his word, what needs to change? Oh, plenty needs to change. Plenty. Our passage today starts in verse 9. Let me read it. But let the brother of humble circumstances glory in his high position, and let the rich man in his humiliation, <clears throat> because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind, and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed, so too the rich man, in the midst of his pursuits, will fade away. Here this passage helps us to understand that at the foot of the cross, everybody's equal. It doesn't matter what status in life you happen to be. It doesn't matter what you have or what you do not have. It doesn't matter if you have gold rings. It doesn't matter if you have uh, nice cars. It doesn't matter if you don't have any of those things. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. All of us, all of us are absolutely equal in God's, way, in, in God's uh, kingdom. His kingdom accepts anybody who will come. Jesus is coming to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, in the book of Matthew chapter 11. And he tells us in here that it doesn't matter if you are a rich man. It doesn't matter if you're a poor man. It doesn't matter if you're a free man. It doesn't matter if you're a slave. It doesn't matter from what status you come from. We're all equal. And that's what this passage is wanting us to understand. He, God wants us to understand that, 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 that uh, this life is short-lived. He's going to say it later on in chapter 5 that it's like a vapor. That, that, that's here for a second. Uh, earlier today, Lori and I had um, hot dogs 
uh, for lunch. And we put a screen over the, um, uh, over the boiling hot dogs and put the hot dog buns over it to, so that that steam, that vapor would come up and heat those up. But the steam doesn't last very long. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's still not filling the house that I'm sitting in right now. It's gone. To be forgotten, gratefully. But we, we, we see that, that our life, as he's talking about here, the sun rises, the scorching wind and withers, the grass and the flowers fall off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So, too, the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. None of us, none of us have, uh, at least on the bottom of our feet, an expiration date. I can't look at my heel and say, ah, I've got a couple of more years. You don't. We don't know how much longer. Um, we have, um, since we've been in this, uh, uh, this shutdown, this lockdown, uh, three uh, of our members uh, have passed away. And, and, and it's been very, very sad because families couldn't be there with them. Um, and, 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 and two of them were, uh, were quite sudden. Uh, older folks, sure, but still unexpected. I have been preaching now for over 40 years. Um, I've attended, um, I preached the funerals for many, many folks over these years. Uh, many of them were unexpected. Accidents, um, disease, um, some at the uh, latter stages of life. But I have performed the, uh, the funerals from uh, newborns uh, to people who were 100 years old. We don't know. Uh, and because of that, we need to understand that as we are in our brotherhood, the brotherhood of Christ, that as we are here, we are all equal. He, he's going to really deal with this later on in the book when we talks about how we... Uh, play favorite sometimes with Mr. and Mrs. Got's Lots versus Mr. and Mrs. Who's Got Nothing, and we treat one better than we treat the other, he says that should not happen. That should not happen. Verse 12 now, he says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. <clears throat> the crown of life uh, is... Uh, uh, the ultimate goal, and, and it's not the goal. It's not the the, the crown that we're that we're reaching for. What we're what we're try, uh, striving for is what that crown represents. What it represents is our Lord handing it to us, giving it to us, maybe even uh, 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 placing it on our heads, so that we can later on, as the apostles do in the book of. Uh, revelation they cast the crowns down because those crowns they don't mean anything it's the one who presents those crowns to us that's what's important he's the one that we glorify he's gonna he's gonna say later on um, as we talked about in verses 9 through 11 when he says that we are to glory uh, in our high place or our low place it doesn't matter but that glory is to God it is to proclaim his excellencies not ours. And so in verse 12, he wants us to know that, that, that trials are coming. He's introduced this idea in verse 2, uh, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Well, now he's going to talk about here that when we do, we need to persevere. The word persevere has that idea of not giving up, not giving in, remaining strong. One of the uh, 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 Greek uh, lexicons talked about it as being someone who never gives up, never stops, has, has read God's promises, has taken them into his heart, and because of those promises, it doesn't matter what comes their way. It doesn't matter what the difficult time is. This person is going to stay true to God's word no matter what. And that's what he's talking about. Blessed is a man who perseveres with a trial for once he has been approved. You get that? Going through the trials equals being approved by God. Now, I like that. I like the idea that, 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 that as we 
progress, as we mature in Christ, as we grow from, from infants, that first Peter chapter, second Peter chapter two talks about, when we grow from infants uh, uh, in, in our Christianity until we mature as a full man, Paul talks about in the book of First Corinthians, in, in the book of Ephesians chapter four, as we mature, as we grow, we're slowly, hopefully not real slow, slowly putting away the things, the deeds of the flesh, we're, 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 we're seeing where God wants us. We're seeing where we are. As we look at that mirror of the soul, and as we do so, we are instantly recognizing that something is wrong here, not here, here. And because there's something wrong here, I'm the one that needs to change. I'm the one that needs to change. I've, I've done some counseling uh, over the years, nothing, no license, no nothing like that, just good old Bible counseling with people, and I've come to the conclusion that, that, that there's lots of folks out there, lots of folks that, that they have problems, but the problems are not theirs. The problem is always somebody else. It's their wife, it's their husband, it's their kids, it's their boss, it's their neighborhood, it's their upbringing. The problem is never them, and therefore they never change, and sadly, they're always, they always seem to be in trouble. To some degree or another, they just always seem to be in trouble. But James says, blesses is the man who perseveres under trial. That is, he remains under, and then he will receive, and then he will receive that crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. I want you to think for a moment as you go through the Bible from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. Where has God not kept a promise? I'll give you a second to think about that. I know I don't. There are no places where God has made a promise and says, eh, eh, no, I'm not going to do that now. God keeps his promises. God does what he says. And when you and I come to a trial, we come to a difficult time in our life, a testing sometimes. And we'll talk about the difference in just a second. The, 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 the testing that we receive is for us to improve. It's, and, 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 and when we do, God says, ah, there's that crown of life. Here's what you have uh, will receive because of your lack of uh, uh, give up uh, giving up on me. You continue to love me. You continue to have faith in me. So he says in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Even in the light of that very plain Bible passage, I am amazed when, when people are tempted, when they fail, those tests when they when they fall flat on their face and how many times they just they, they want to blame God they want to get to the point to where the blame for their faults doesn't lie on them it's not their fault I didn't do it the idea here is that is that God plainly states he doesn't tempt anybody. Now, what's the difference between a test and a God does test us. As a matter of fact, we're going to get to a passage in a minute that helps us to see that we need to test ourselves. But in this passage, we have God who will test us, but not tempt us. Now, what's the difference between a temptation and a test? We're going to get the answer here, but briefly, this is basically the answer. A, a test is designed to help us to grow, to find out where we have grown. I remember in school, um, a teacher would tell us, we will have a test this Friday on this particular section uh, of the book. And so uh, up until then, you're reading the book, you're studying it and getting yourself ready for that test. And when the teacher gives you the test and you you write down the answers and you pass in that piece of paper and then the next day the teacher comes back and says here is your grade here is how well you did on this particular test a temptation however on the other hand is designed not to measure your growth 
A temptation is there to destroy you. It's there to, to, to knock us down, to, uh, to totally knock us off. As a matter of fact, we're going to read, uh, we're going to uh, see a word here in a minute that uses the word deception. Uh, the word deception is, 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 is a word that is designed to trick us, to make us think that something is, is, that is wrong, to make us think that it is right. Um, Paul is going to say in the book of 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. One of the uh, ministries that I'm involved in is a House on the Rock ministry. Well, we had these men who were coming uh, out of drug rehab, alcohol rehab, uh, or even a mixture of the two of them, um, and coming out of lifestyles that, that are certainly not uh, approved by God. Um, and as a result of this, um, uh, when, they, when they come out of rehab, the worst thing that can happen to them is to go right back into the environment where they got dirty to begin with. Usually that involves family, friends, uh, acquaintances, neighborhoods. Um, uh, when, when you have come out of environment and that environment totally poisoned your soul, then why would you want to go back to that? And, 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 we, are, and we are tricked. We are deceived by Satan by saying, well, well, well that's family. I, I can't abandon family. Well, as far as, as right and wrong is concerned, did your family abandon you? Did they lead you into a path away from God? You see, I've been told this, and I have told my kids this, and I've told other people this over and over and over, over the years. And that is that if somebody, and I don't really care who it is, it can be family, friend, acquaintance, it can be co-workers, it doesn't matter who it is. If they're leading you away from Christ, away from God, away from the Word, they are not your friend. I know that's hard. That's tough. But the reality is, is what's more important, your eternal soul or your friend's? I've had to put away friends in the past. People that, that I thought loved me. But in reality, they, they didn't. Uh, they wanted me to join in, in their revelry. They wanted me to, to continue the way that I used to live. But somewhere along the line, you've got to draw that line in the sand. And God does that for us. And never cross it. Never cross it. And don't allow others to come to you to drag you back over that line. So he says here, the one who is tempted, um, each one, verse 14, each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. What's the source of me being dragged away? Eh, the, 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 the secondary source may be my friends and family, but it's my desire. What I want to do, as opposed to what God wants me to do, as, as, as I see things, as I want to, to participate in things that are harmful at best, if not deadly, to my soul. And I, and I want this, my own lust. And he says here that, um, uh, that when lust uh, has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. <laughs> Paul said in the book of Romans chapter 6 verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. Um, I, I, I have a way of helping people understand the difference uh, 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 between physical and spiritual death. I'm, I've sinned and obviously uh, at least at one point was dead to God. Well, uh, I check my pulse and physically I'm still alive. But in God's economy, in God's world, I'm dead. I can come back to life, don't get me wrong, uh, by believing and trusting, uh, by uh, uh, hearing, uh, repenting, confessing, being immersed in water for the forgiveness of his sins. And once I have done that, 
Now, as I live my life and, and, and I see that I have failed a test, I have succumbed to a temptation to, of, of my own lust, now it's time to repent. We're going to get to that in chapter 4 when he says, resist the devil, submit to God, and Satan will flee you. But there's that, there's that submission and resistance that has to take place first, prefaced by repentance. <sighs> Verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. There's the word. Do not be deceived. I am convinced, and, 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 and being convinced of this one thing, that this world is here to do one thing, to deceive you and me. The, the beauty of this world uh, and, and how man can, can make bad look so good. They can, they can make that which is good look so bad. And, and, and to those we succumb sometimes. We, we give in. We, 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 we allow them. And yet James is saying, don't be deceived. Don't let this get to you. And so he says here, uh, every good thing bestowed, verse 17, uh, every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of lights, which, which there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his, of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we might be, as it were, the first fruits among his creatures. The word of truth. He's going to talk about that. We'll get to it next week. But he's going to talk about that, 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 that word of truth. Uh, Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, to those Jews who had believed in him, he says, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. And then that, that fateful night when Jesus um, prayed to his father in the, what we call the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17, um, he prayed for three things that night. He prayed for himself, he prayed for his apostles, and he prayed for you and me. But verse 17, he's talking to God and he goes, sanctify them in truth. Your word is true. Brothers and sisters, we need to anchor our soul right here in God's Word. We need to be the people who are going to study, who are going to look at God's Word, who are going to do the very things that God wants us to do in order to make sure that that crown of life will be awarded to us by the one and the only one who can award that crown. I pray that today's... Uh, lesson has blessed you uh, as it has blessed me. Um, I want you to know that, that we are praying for you. Uh, we're praying for uh, the church and, and hopefully this, this whole uh, COVID-19 uh, shutdown will be over soon and we'll be back together, uh, hugging one another next, uh, loving on one another, uh, and seeing to it that everyone is doing just fine. In the meantime, let God, through his word, bless your soul. God bless, and we'll see you next time.